Hurricane season runs from June through November in Florida, but preparing for a storm is a year-round effort at the Southwest Florida Water Management District. Today, we're going to talk about the district's emergency management team and get an inside look at what it takes to prepare for emergency situations such as hurricanes. You'll discover exactly how this work helps protect and aid our community when storms hit. This is the Water Matters Podcast. You're listening to the Water Matters Podcast, brought to you by the Southwest Florida Water Management District. We answer your most popular questions about the work we do and services we offer, including new projects, springs protection, water conservation efforts, and more. Learn about the many ways we serve the community and protect your water resources. Welcome to this episode of the Water Matters Podcast. I'm your host, Michelle Sager, and today we're talking about the district's Emergency Operations Center, more commonly known as the EOC. This team is made up of dozens of staff from across the district to help form and execute emergency plans. Joining us today is Tim Fallon, a planning section chief on that team. Thanks for joining us today, Tim. Well, thanks, Michelle, for the invite. I'm glad to be here. I want to talk about our EOC and what we're doing this year what we do to prepare for hurricane season, and other stuff we do that doesn't involve a hurricane, uh, especially the preparedness and the documentation and the reporting that we do. Great. Well, I'm sure you're going to give us a lot of great information. Let's start with the more obvious roles of the district during a storm response. We are the water management district, and minimizing flood risks are part of the mission. The EOC has an entire section of staff known as structure operations. Talk a little bit about what they do. Okay, structure operations. It doesn't seem intuitive what they do. They operate structures. A structure is a dam, essentially. So they're dam operators. They open and close gates, and they move water through the dam to equilibrate water levels, to create more space in the area they're confining with the dam, and then that receives rainfall. So it's important that they also monitor the weather and uh, precipitation forecasts to determine how much water they'll need to move, especially before a hurricane, because they need to create the space to absorb all that water. And these structures are located all over some of our freshwater systems across the district, correct? They are. We do have 67 water conservation structures, 63 miles of canals, 17 flood control structures, dams essentially, and seven miles of earthen dams. So the public may not be familiar with our structures, but they probably have seen them and may not realized it, especially in the Tampa area, because uh, we have what's called the Tampa Bypass Canal. Can you explain this system a little bit? Because it's a pretty important system. Absolutely. The Tampa Bypass Canal is a series of structures and canals that moves water around Tampa. It begins at Trout Creek, which you can see our levee off of I-75 near Morris Bridge Road, just north of that. And it goes the whole way down to our lower structure called S-160 which is near the Orient Road Jail. So that allows water to bypass Tampa and limits flooding on the Hillsborough River. We can actually shut down the Hillsborough River with the lower Hillsborough flood detention area, which I think is very impressive. You know, the capacity that we can hold back, I'm not sure how many days of flow it would take. That depends on conditions such as precipitation, the amount of water in the river. But it is impressive structure. And it was built by the Army Corps of Engineers, and we maintain it. And holding back that water prevents flooding in the Temple Terrace, Tampa areas, correct? It helps, yes. And and there are different combinations of dams as they open or close them that can allow our operators to to utilize that system to its, its best capacity. Wow, that's really interesting. It is a very interesting structure and plays such an important role in this area. Now, the district also may offer a lot of support to other agencies during a storm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, absolutely. We have a lot of pumps. We have a lot of chainsaws. We send them out after a storm. We sent crews down to the city of Englewood Water Management District after Hurricane Ian to help them clear debris to get to a lift station. Uh, We sent pumps recently to the city of Hialeah. This is all within the past few years. And we help them move water after a storm. Uh, Even in non-hurricane events, Washington County, we sent pumps up in December to help them alleviate some localized flooding as well. And that was much appreciated. Now, I know you're talking about equipment, but sometimes we also send staff to help, right? Because some of these communities that get hammered, they're so overwhelmed by what they have to tackle that they sometimes need our help, correct? Like we've sent some staff to help with that. In in the past, we have. We Mm -hmm. have also helped with engineering and geotechnical support. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that is kind of a cool mission within the past few years. After Ian, we actually took our water quality group And we sent them to Charlotte County 
and they were monitoring water quality and the effects of the storm and and the the drainage into the Charlotte Harbor after that. And that went on for, um, I want to say a month or a little longer. And that was a really cool mission because we were actually able to use our daytime jobs to support a very unique and niche mission. That's a great point because data collection is also part of the EOC and plays an important role that people may not think of when you're talking about emergency response. Can you talk a little bit about what our data collection folks do besides just water quality? Yes. It's interesting. We were talking about structural operations before and our Tampa bypass canal and the dams and how they move water. How do they know how much water to move? You need to know where the water level is. Data collection we collect that data for them and get it to the operators so they can make the proper decisions, the right decisions to move the water the best they can to avoid flooding. And that's we actually call that flood fighting during a storm. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And I know there is a team that documents flood lines, uh, maybe, you know, sometimes days, weeks after a storm passes, but that's an important piece of information to collect. It is. And uh, Dr. Mark Fulkerson, uh, at the district, he's key in that. And he kind of leads the charge in terms of high watermark collection after the storm. So he has a lot of resources out, not only internally, but for the public to uh, say, hey, the water was up to my garage or my foundation. Mark it. Let us know. And then Mark will take that information and that helps them build better flood models. Tim, can you explain what a flood model is? The flood modeling is essentially a predictive tool. Hey, this area is going to flood. It has flooded in the past, and it helps the district understand the hydrology or the way water moves and collects in certain areas of the district. And that's important because, especially we've seen throughout the decades in Florida, that there have been changes. So an area that may not have flooded, you know, 20, 30 years ago could flood now. So it's important to keep up with that data, correct? It is. And that's why we have excellent modelers who make those models. Absolutely. There's also a lot of work done by our IT team, facilities, communications. Talk a little about the work done internally to keep the district functioning during and after a storm. I'm going to join two things that we talked about, data collection at the dams and the dam operator. How do they get the data? That's IT. IT transfers that data from the DCB equipment to the operators. And that's essentially real time and then they're able to make the best decisions. When it comes to our public information officer, these folks are great. They get the district's message out in a timely fashion. They always say the right thing, and they represent our mission well. So we, we love them. We love them here. I couldn't do what they do. And we have so many different support groups that help us out, from our pump crews that we talked about previously to our, our finance and admin section. You have to pay the bills. You have to record the costs, and you have to make sure you're using the taxpayer's money efficiently and effectively. Absolutely. And those support staff also play an important role in informing and keeping our staff safe because that is important. We have a job to do, but we also want to make sure that our staff are safe during these storms. And all of those different people, whether it's keeping the communications lines open through our IT department or making sure that the facilities are safe before we go back to them are important. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, I absolutely agree. And I want to talk about our facilities people. They, of course, run our campuses. We shutter a good number of our buildings beforehand to, to protect the buildings from storms. And these folks, after the storm, actually become part of our chainsaw crews, our response crews. So everybody has a job to do, and that's very important. And I want to touch on something as well. We do respond to hurricanes. But when the hurricane's coming, we also give our people time to get out and take care of their family. So you need to have, hey, you know, my house is in the path. I need to board it up and get the dog out of there. Please do. And when you're done come on back and then we'll get busy with uh, a hurricane response. That's absolutely correct. We have to balance our family life with our work life and serving the community in our, our roles. So the work that the EOC does really is tremendous in helping the staff balance that, in my opinion. Now, we've discussed all these various people who have roles on the EOC team. A big part of your job is getting them trained and ready in case the area gets hit by a storm and they are called into action. Walk us through some of the various trainings you do with our staff. So we do have select staff, people of the EOC who attend FEMA trainings or state trainings. And in May, we go to the governor's hurricane conference. So a key position will go to that conference for a few days, learn what they're doing, learn more about what they're doing. And we get new techniques that are brought back to the district that we use. And that's wonderful for our mission. We also have an annual exercise that we hold in May 
This year it was a week long and we did drills, practical exercises, functional exercises, theoretical exercises. And we were able to allow each niche, each job within EOC to practice what it does or develop a process for future uh, use. Can you give an example of one of the trainings? Because uh, these hands-on activities are so important. I know I personally find them valuable. Just give us an example of one of those trainings that occurs during May. One that we're, we did in May was a continuity training. And we took the field staff who operate the structures or get the structures prepared for operation. And we took other staff, our facility staff, we took a member of the fleet staff, and we actually took a member of our water quality unit, one of the scientists, and let them go out to one of our structures, pull the pins off the gates, put the buoys across the river. This is S-155 across the Hillsborough River, and they were able to operate it. So if our field staff were unable to get there in time to operate the structure, we have other staff trained to be able to do that. Wow, that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Finally, what do you think is the most important takeaway from your work with the EOC? This is a good question. And one thing I found, I've worked in government before and have had good experiences. Here we have excellent senior leadership. The support we get from them allows us to do this mission. When we come up with a new idea, hey, we want to do a functional exercise or a full-scale exercise. Okay, let's practice it. Is it relevant to what we do? Of course, it's the first question that is asked. Yes, we, sh we prove that it is. Okay, make it happen. And this allows the district to be more prepared. We practice a lot, and we get that support. That's huge, and not every place has that. And uh, I'm going to give a plug for the district right now. I like working here because of that, because we do get support, not only in the EOC, in my regular day job. I work as a hydrogeologist. I get a lot of really good support, too. And I think that goes back to our mission and values of, you know, we understand that in order for us to serve the public, we have to be at our very best. And so I do think our leadership recognizes that and tries to provide us those resources and the opportunities to make that happen when you agree. Absolutely. They're very responsive to our needs. Well, this has been a lot of great information. And thank you for sharing this with our audience today. You're welcome. I'm glad you invited me. I love talking about the EOC, of course. It's a passion of mine. My day job I love and I get to do both here at the district. We should probably explain that this is the EOC isn't your day job. You do have another job, full-time job here at the district. Do you want to tell people what you do? I do have another full-time job. I work as a hydrogeologist in our exploratory drilling program. Um, so I have active sites. I have one in Ruskin uh, that will go on until August. And I'm there usually every day. And uh, that's an interesting job. I'd love to do another podcast on that sometime. Yeah, we'll have to get into that topic. All right. Speaking of that, check out our previous episodes on other district topics at watermatters.org slash podcast. And thanks again for listening to the Water Matters podcast. Mm -hmm.